Good morning, everybody. I don't know if you still think that we should preach. It feels to me that we have had service already. I walked into Brother, Brother Ray Sai's class this morning, and he was evangelical in his approach to his lesson. And now I, my sister has blessed us a remarkable rendition and I don't think it is possible for anybody to sit in an audience and not know that the magical hands of Brother Seely are around. So I feel good already. But I came here at your invitation to say a word and I will endeavor to say that word as briefly as possible. I heard by the Mark saying that I think normally you get out of here by what? 12 o'clock? Yeah. Eh? What? It's 10? Is it 11.30? All right. Well, I have a few things to say and it won't take me long. But I must first thank you for the invitation to be here with you this morning. I have not been doing a lot of preaching out because I have duties at Gardens Church and, and therefore I don't wander too far from home these days. But I have a lot of friends here at Breath of Life. I dare not attempt to call them all by name this morning lest I miss somebody who is ought to be on the list, but let me just say that all of you know, everybody at Breath of Life belongs to me. I must commend you, because wherever I go these days, I hear about your steadfastness in the promulgation of the gospel by the medical work that you do your name and fame has gone abroad. I congratulate you. It's, I must say that it is inoculating us at Gardens as well. Because of you, Gardens has been ignited. Which tells me that if you are diligent enough and take that one match that you have and use it productively, you can start a forest fire. So please continue to do what you are doing. My remarks this morning are designed principally to resensitize you, all of us, to who we are. A lot of us do not employ all of the energy available to us because we either do not know how to use the throttle or whatever reason is that we go around too many of us. Eight cylinder models, we are designed to be eight cylinder models and we go around working on two cylinders like a motor scooter. And I want to challenge God's people this morning. I don't care who you are or where you come from. Whether you had the benefit of secondary education or not, in the eyes of God, you are special, ordained for a purpose. And God is going to deal with you if you get back and hide behind yourself and say that I have nothing to contribute. Every last member in the hearing of my voice this morning has been ordained by God for a purpose and that is to preach this everlasting gospel. You don't have to be able to stand at the desk. Byron White speaks in Testimonies, Volume 6, about the one person congregation. 
If you work somewhere and you are diligent, there is somebody next to you at your level who wants to hear a word. They may not take it from me, but you will have influence. Let me give you a little story real quick before I start. We had a crusade a couple of weeks ago at Mount, uh, Gardens Church down in Sand Hill. And about six months or so before that crusade, a lady came to the pastor with a sense of urgency and said, Pastor, I don't have time to wait for any crusade, any tent, or any of that stuff. I want to get baptized right now. And she was insistent. And she said, Pastor, do it. The pastor called her and they had their sessions and she and her husband both were baptized. And she came to the crusade that we had no more than a few months in the church. And she is a district nurse and she went to our hospital where she works and she was able to bring two people from her workplace to the crusade and both of them were baptized. I'm happy that one of them has accompanied me here this morning. Sister Sobers, stand up, let the folks see you. That is one soul. Okay, there, you may sit. That is one soul that was one to Christ, a one person congregation. No tent, no pomp, no ceremony, not hundreds of thousands of dollars, but one person recognizing that even though I don't know a lot, I know what God has done for me, and I'm going to let the world know about it. So I'm here to tell you this morning that I want to challenge you. The message that I have chosen has in it some cautions. The Lord tells me, Brother Johnson, some of the folk are going to get, going to get offended. And I'm apologizing real early. I didn't have, I don't have any briefs. I don't know too much about you. I know about Red Side. But I am not going to say anything bad about Red Side, my friend. And I don't know anything bad about him anyhow. But the Lord says that whenever, did you hear what I just said? Whenever you stand up and you say things that I want you to say, somebody is going to get offended. But somebody there needs to hear what I want you to say. And that is why I chose our scripture reading this morning. Let me just begin by telling you there's a word I want to introduce you to. Some of you know it already. It's a word called anomie. A-N-O-M-I-E. Emil Durkheim is one of the principal founders of modern sociological thought. Durkheim, Karl Marx, and Max Weber are through three of the principal sociological commentators. They had a lot to say about a lot of things, but one thing they talked about, and particularly Durkheim in his classical essay on suicide, he said, this word, anime, is an important word in our world today. Anime describes a social condition characterized by instability. You listening to me carefully? If I catch any fella not in here this morning, it's going to be me and you. So keep your eyes open. If you've got to get a matchstick to prop them open, go ahead and do that. But don't you dare. Anime, he said, describes a condition characterized by instability, resulting from a breakdown of normative behavior or standards and values. In other words, anime ain't good. 
It is a condition that debilitates, robs us of our energy, particularly of our sense of who we are. And he says that condition is so debilitating that it is capable of leading people into depression and suicide because they do not know who they are. Have you ever been in Bridgetown and you watched young men digging around in the garbage looking for something to eat? Would you do that? Would you? Could you? The answer is no. You cannot dig around in the garbage looking for food. I don't care how hungry you are. You will go and come and ask me if I have a lead pipe that I could help you out with. But when you see a man in the garbage digging around and drinking water from, I've seen this my own eyes, drinking water from the gutter, you know that that guy is gone. He has no sense of who he is. And if you were to dig and look, you may be able to find that he has a background worthy of note. But something happened. The forces of the world, the forces of evil, have driven him to the point where he is departed from himself and to become completely somebody else. But you know, even though we don't drink water from the gutter, some of us in church are suffering from this same anomie. Crime is increasing everywhere. Is that right or not wrong? The world is behaving, engaging in all kinds of behaviors, right or wrong. And what bothers me more than anything else is that the behaviors of the world are not just affecting the world. Those behaviors are creeping into God's church. I said creeping. Because if anybody came in here and did foolishness, a big, a big foolishness, you would hold him and put him out. Because you would know that is gross. That not, not to happen in here. But if he comes in and he does some small things, um, let that one slide. Let that one slide. And that continues to happen until moral decadence and decay sets in. Durkheim argues that this enemy is at the heart of social and psychological dislocations that cause depression and leads to suicide. Do you have any idea how many people commit suicide each year in the United States? How many? A thousand? 38,000 people every single year commit suicide in the United States. A young boy just last week, nine years old, nine years old, dealing with the demons inside of him, decided that he has better solve the problem by letting his friends know that he is gay. Nine years old, he decided to come out. And the youngsters with whom he associated did what youngsters generally do, began to bully and taunt. You know where the young man is today? Nine years old, last week, he committed suicide because he was conflicted. Lost his mind and a sense of purpose. That means that somebody somewhere failed that youngster. Right here before me this morning are a bunch of people who have responsibility. And I want to be sensitizing you. I didn't come here to quarrel with you. I came here to reason with you. And I came here to exhort because all of us have a duty to perform that God is waiting on us to perform. The Oktoberfest, have you ever heard of it in Germany? The Oktoberfest it's a time when everybody becomes equal. My wife, and I spent, my wife and I spent two and a half years in Germany. 
As a matter of fact, her first child was born over there. And the October Fest is a festival where everybody, high and low, rich and poor, free and bond, put on masks and jump in the streets. And equality happens. Everybody at that moment is equal. There is no differentiation of people. You can grow up me and I can grow up you. And it is acceptable and expected behavior. That is why you put on the mask. Because when you put on the mask, you deny yourself. I am not who I am. So anybody can do anything to me because I don't know too much about it anyhow. I don't think we have to go all the way to Germany or even to Brazil to know what I'm talking about. You ever heard of a thing called crop over? Isaiah says people everywhere are going away backwards. He's complaining that something is happening among God's people. We are not putting on masks and jumping in the street. But a lot of us are masking our identities. Because we do not want anybody to know who we are. We are hiding from God. Just a few weeks ago, you would have heard about this. A church leader, Anglican priest, marched in the gray, gay, whatever that thing is, parade. And in order to make sure that you did not interfere with him, he said, listen to me. I have a right to do this. And these people have a right to do whatever it is they're doing. And we are not to be constrained by that silly little book. You know what book he was talking about? The Bible. He said, don't let the Bible stop you. Who's talking? A priest. One who is supposed to uphold the principles of that book. And he is saying... It's a silly little book. You know why it's silly? Because it interferes with a lifestyle that he wants to support and that he wants to enable and empower. And consequently, in order to do that and feel liberated, you have to get rid of what that book says. It is happening in the Seventh-day Adventist Church as well. I heard... Brother Ray Said said this morning, I don't know if he looked at my notes or whatever, but he said this morning that there are some churches belonging to this organization that do not want to hear the name Ellen White mentioned. They tell you up front before you get up and preach. Uh, we, don't, um, we don't handle that here, okay? So when you preach, don't say nothing about her. Well, I already called her name once. And I'm asking you to read Testimonies, Volume 6, and see what she said on a whole lot of subjects, particularly in the area of, of evangelism. Just a few weeks ago, President Trump invited a whole host of top-ranking evangelical preachers, the big shots in the, in the church. He called them to the White House for food and to talk. And you know what they came out saying? That Donald Trump is the most consequential president in the history of the United States. He, they did not tell you that he's the most liar pre, uh, president ever. They didn't mention that. They say he is the most consequential. He has done more for equality. I heard a black man, a black preacher. Lord, this black man, a preacher of the everlasting gospel, stood up and said, this president has done more for black people than anybody else before him. A black preacher used as a tool by Donald Trump to subvert our people's thinking. Ten years ago, ten years ago, Donald Trump, Donald Trump could not even have considered seriously running for president because people at that time would not have cared about him. But the world has changed. And as the world, world changes, 
everything around the chin. Now, I am a little bit of a fisherman. I have a boat. And I can tell you two experiences about that boat. One, how the world or how turbulence interferes. I was out in the sea, and they tug out of the harbor of Bridgetown. They tug that one that goes down and pulls around the ships and stuff. It was going north, and it passed by me, about from here to the road. And I was just looking at it and shaking at the guys. But when it had gone by about three minutes or so, my boat all but went over, and my, my boat is a big, big enough boat that no dog tugging had it. it. My boat whoppity, whoppity, whip, whip, whip. And I thought we were done for. You know what I was? That's a thing they call wake. I want you to know that there is wake outside there that is affecting this church. God's church. As the world does its foolishness, it is rocking the church. And God is the only person who can keep us stabilized. We have to spend a lot of time in prayer, folks. I don't think we do enough of that. We have to spend time on our knees talking to God and asking him to reassert himself in our lives and help us to recognize that we are special. My, my granddaughter, not too long ago, was considered to be an athlete at the SDA secondary school. And as sports day approached, she became ill with the flu. And she said to all of us, I can't run today. But she went to work, went to the, went to the stadium anyhow, and her friends got a hold of her and made her run. They told her, you got to do it for the team today. She said, but I'm sick, I can't do it. She said, but you got to do it today. And you know something? She ran. Not one race. She ran three races. And she came first in all three of those races. The topic of my sermon this morning is, I can't, but I can. I can't, but I can. Our Father and our God, we come before you this morning empty. I ask you to hide me. I ask you to put words in my mouth that whatever I say today to your people will not be to condemn, but to exhort us to remember who we are and whose we are, to use every ounce of our being to your name's honor and to your glory. Please grant us that favor in Jesus' name, amen. God created us for his glory. But we have allowed a whole lot of things that go on around us to impair us, our ability, cause us to become doubtful of who we are. I want you to turn to, with me to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. That is our scripture reading, and we go there now. Just for reference, 1 Peter 2, 9. Let me start at verse 7. Unto you, therefore, which believe... Listen to me. Unto you, therefore, which believe. There are two classes of people that are being addressed here in this text. Unto you who believe, Christ is precious. So the first thing you have to recognize is that if you are going to utilize the virtue of Christ, you first have to believe. But unto them that are disobedient, he becomes, in verse 8, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. God is going to be 
an obstacle in our path. We are not going to be able to use the virtue that he gives us for his glory. If we, believe, if we don't believe. But once we believe, once we believe, something happens here. Watch this. You are going to recognize that you are a chosen generation. Chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A peculiar people. That's who you are, first of all. Understand that you are no namsy pamsy person. Every last person in the hearing of my voice this morning is chosen by God. Now what you do with that chosenness is your business. But God has chosen you. And he emphasizes it further when he says, You did not choose me, but I chose you, John 15, 16. And I chose you for a purpose, that you would show forth the praises of him who has called you. Out of darkness, you got to bear fruit. He said, I chose you that you would bear fruit. Go and evangelize. And when you do that, all power is given to you. And what you ask me for, you missed that part. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me show you. Because some of y'all don't believe what I'm saying here now. Is that right? Look, John 15 and verse 16. Let's look at it real quick. Ye have not chosen me. So don't get the idea that you, picked, you came to God. God came to you and dragged you from everywhere you were and he says, I got a purpose for you. I chose you. you. And he said this word. This is a word that we believe and know to be important and ordained you. So all of us in here Every last man in here is ordained. Not just the deacons and the first elders. Every man in here is ordained by God. That you should go and bring forth fruit. And that your fruit should remain. That is important. You can't bear fruit and then all drop off because they're false you must bear fruit and that fruit has to remain that whatsoever you shall ask the father in my name I may give it you the Lord said I want to give you everything you deserve and desire now a lot of us were going to ask foolish. you're going to ask him for a jet plane and all that the Lord ain't going to hear that you have to ask for power you have to ask God to sustain you, mind you, look after you, remind you of who you are day in and day out. Lord, don't let me forget that I am not an ordinary nobody. Teach me to believe when you tell me you are special, ordained for a purpose. Lord, help me to fulfill that purpose. That's what we got to do. I was in Spikestone the other day at the pharmacy and I saw a young lady. That lady was so beautiful. It was, I mean, a stunning young lady. She was a pharmacist. And I kept staring at her because she was striking. I couldn't take it any longer. I asked her, Miss can I ask you a personal question? Do you have any idea what that personal question was that I asked her? See, anybody in here? A thousand dollars. What did I ask her? Eh? You were close. I asked her, are you a self-day Adventist? You know why? In my mind, the mind that I have of what a Seventh-day Adventist is supposed to look like, she was the crowning epitome of that. That lady was, she was, didn't have all the foolishness. 
plain and simple, but I mean stunning. She asked me, why are you asking me that? I said, because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And she laughed at me, and she says, I am not a Seventh-day Adventist, but I am affirming my pilgrim heritage. You hear what I just said? She knew who she was. A pilgrim holiness Christian. You remember the days when the pilgrim holiness used to have long sleeves right down? Neck up to here? You remember those days? Are you too young? Neck up to here. I taught in Antigua. That was my first job when I left school. We went to Antigua to teach and I taught with a young pilgrim holiness girl. We used to make her snort. I was wicked in those days. Give her a fit because she was up to here, down to here. And she didn't do anything at all to her hair. But she was affirming her pilgrim heritage. The pilgrim holding this church, in case you have not noticed, have morphed. They wear jewelry now. They don't wear long sleeves anymore. Nor do they have their necks up to here anymore. The church has changed. But this lady, although she has made modest modifications to her attire, she still looks fresh. And I said, Lord, where are my Adventist girls? Why are they not in your face with their beauty natural as God put you down here on the earth get in the people's face and let them know let them ask you let them ask you who are you because when we look like everybody else there's a mix up I don't know who is who and what is what you have to make a difference you have to let that difference be manifest you hear what I'm saying I'm not quarreling with anybody this morning I'm just telling you what God says you are peculiar. That word in the dictionary has not changed in meaning. It still means strange, different from the rest. And I want you this morning to understand that what I'm asking you to do is to assert that difference. Let people come up to you and say, what, what gives here? How do you account for the fact that you are so beautiful and you don't have all no faults? You ever been into, you ever been into Price Smart lately? Price Smart? The black ladies have on the blondest wigs you can want to find. Go the next morning, they have on a purple wig. The next day, they have on a green wig. They don't know who they are. Cannot allow that kind of enemy and confusion, mental confusion, to creep into the church of God. You are ordained by God to look different, to be different, to speak different, to eat different. I you understand you're eating different already because you have this health program going up here, right? All of that. All of that. Understand, therefore, I am going to finish in a minute or two. My text is in Jeremiah. Let's go there. And this is one of the most beautiful books in the Bible. I'm giving you homework to do. When you go home today at lunch, read Jeremiah. You may not be able to go through it all at one time. But I'm going to give you a test this morning. And I believe it's going to taste good. And you will want to see what else it has to say. Jeremiah chapter 1. And my text is found at verse 17. Thou therefore gird up the loins and do what? And arise. What does arise mean? Get up. That means you're sitting down, right? The God is saying the breath of life this morning. Hey! Get up! Gird up your loins. 
Speak unto them. Everything that I command you. Listen. He doesn't stop there. What does he say? Do not be afraid of their faces. You know, I told you I was going to get in trouble. If I read this, I got to get into trouble. Because the Lord is saying things that we are doing that he doesn't want us to do. He wants to reform us. He wants to transform us. He wants to come for our people that are ready. And folks, in these times, if you look around you carefully, you will see that this world is in desperate trouble. For the last, I don't know how many months, there are fires burning in California that can't get them to put out. I don't care what they do. I remember, I can't recall which book in Sister White, it says the Battle Creek fire, when the people in Battle Creek had gone careless and indifferent with the publishing house and all of that. A fire came and burned out the whole place. And the people who were putting out the fire, the fire marshals, said that that fire, that water that they were pouring on the fire was like gasoline. You know why it was like gasoline? Because it was God's fire. It was God's fire because God had determined that he had to purify his church and make it ready for the mission that he has given to all of us. God said, don't be afraid of anybody. Say what I tell you to say. But I want to, before I go any further, I want to go back to how God starts this whole discussion. He does not walk up to Jeremiah and say, I want you to go and do this. He lays down the pedigree. First of all, that is why I started off by telling you, you are somebody important. God isn't going to talk to you and waste time. He first establishes, I am talking to my people. I want you to listen to what I have to say. Jeremiah came out of the lineage, lineage of priests. But he was hiding in the background. Although his father and all of the others were the priestly line, Jeremiah was scratching back. But the Lord went and put his hand on him and said, I want you. What did Jeremiah, look, look, look what he said. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth, the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of 40 years. But watch this. The son of Hilkiah of the priests. You see that? He came out of a priestly lineage. And what was the response of Jeremiah? Look at it. Verse 6. Then said I, Lord God, behold, give me a break, Lord. I can't talk. The Lord said that is not a problem because I'm going to put words in your mouth. And when I put words in your mouth, you better say them. You better learn how to talk. Because I'm going to hold it against you if you don't. I am a child. You know how many of us in church after 15 and 20 years have not yet risen beyond the status of children? We don't grow spiritually. We don't develop the talents and the resources that God has put in us. We excuse ourselves. I, well, I'm only a cook. I'm only a maid. Do you remember somebody called... Huh? You remember Esther? Yeah. But Esther, I didn't want Esther. The little girl in Syria. You remember Naaman? You remember who the little girl was? Who the evangelist was in Naaman's house? A little maid. You know what? If she did not know who she was, she would be in all kinds of depression. She had every right. She had every right to be quarreling and complaining. She had every right to be depressed because she was taken as a slave from her parents' house, carried over into Syria to be a servant. She could have said, I ain't no servant, and I'm not doing it. And I, matter of fact, she could have said, I am going to put some poison in your food and finish this all together. Did she do that? No. 
she evangelized. Praise the Lord. She said, look, I have an answer for the problem that you have. Brethren, you who work in the kitchens or wherever you work, stop hiding and don't, you know, you know a lot of us work in these places and don't for 40 years and nobody around us know that we are Adventists, you know. We don't want them to know because if they know, they will know that something is wrong with the behaviors they see us doing day in and day out. I know of a case, a lady working in a hotel. Put there by God for the purpose of declaring his word. When she got to the gate one day, down in her bosom was stuff that she had no business to put down in there. And the guard took her and carried her back. Lost her job. You know why? Because she failed to do what God had put her there to do and God allowed her to be embarrassed. The Lord says, don't say I'm a child for thou shalt go. You know, the Lord when he begins to deal with us, he don't play around. He said, Kadir, Kadir, Kadir. No, you have to go. But what did he say? I love my God. He says, I am with thee. Don't get frightened. I am with you. Don't let anybody frighten you because I am there by your side all the time. Then the Lord put some fire on his mouth. And the prophet did not stop declaring the message that God had given to him. Every single one of us in here is put here for the purpose of ensuring that God's standards in his church are maintained. Did you hear me? I spent a hun almost 100 years down here on this earth already. I'm 82 years old. And I spent all of, most of that in this church. And I did not know what a snack was until I become a big hardback man. But now if you don't give your children snack all to church, restless, that's how you train. If you, if you want to train a dog you got to give him little things, don't you? You give him tra treats. Give him treats. And he learns tricks. When you teach people, children, that they can eat in church and do all the other things that they do in church, that is who they're going to grow up to be. No reverence for the house of God. We train them to be... The, uh, not. I, I ain't quarreling with the children, no. I am dealing with y'all, the parents. The parents that put snacks in your bag every day to church. And when the little boy begins to act up, because his, you know about health better than me, when his belly begins to tell him he's hungry, he's, Mommy, I want my snack. And you give it to him. And you let him eat it. And you let him drink it or whatever. That is what God says is happening to cause my church to forget who I am and who they are. I went into the court, the whole town, one day. I was dressed nice. Nice pants and shoes and everything, looking spicky. And I had on a, t a, a, t a shirt jack. A nice one, you know, one of the nice fancy shirt jacks. Black, so I figured that I was cool. And I'm going to this court there, but some traffic violation I don't break the law but sometimes the law gets and as I approach the door the gentleman at the door says excuse me sir can't go in there like that so I looked around and said like what he said you can't put in your shirt I said, is a shirt jack, my man? He said, you hear what I tell you? Put in your shirt or you can't go in there. Who is in there? Who? Man is in there. A man is in there sitting at a bench. And I am told that I can't go in there in a shirt jack. But people coming into church, day in and day out, with blue jeans and sneakers and 
all kinds of odd distractions. It ought not to happen. If you, you want to know what reverence ought to be, if you can do it, listen to me now, if you can't do it before an earthly, it doesn't have to be a monarch, an earthly figure, if you can't do it before in his presence, it ought to be inappropriate in God's presence. Amen. Can we agree on that? Yes. If you can't do it in district air court, you ought not to be able to do it in your mind. I'm not saying anybody should push you out of this church when you come in. But your conscience, since you are in sync with God, ought to tell you, maybe I ought not to do this in the house of God. Those are the little things that I am talking about that come in and that we don't pay any attention to. And before we know what has happened, it's too late. I saw, I have a young man who teaches, who is learning theology at CUC. He's here on vacation. You know what the man told me? He said, Brother Johnson, I am at CUC. No, it isn't called that now. Southern, what? University of Southern Caribbean. He said, I am there now. He said, but I am conflicted because the things I hear my professors telling me do not square with all that I have been taught as a child growing up in a Christian household. Th these are the teachers. And watch this. And watch this. Just a few short months ago, a professor from the Northern University, a professor of theology, came out, made a big UT, UT, U2, I don't know if you've seen it, but he's related to Pastor McCollum's sister. He grew up in the same household that she grew up in. Professor, and he came out and said, I'm done with this. Everything that he has been teaching all of these years about the Sabbath, and all of those things, he said, I don't believe that no more. And he's gone off with his own ministry. How do you think that happened? Overnight? No. The devil was sowing canker worms in there a long period of time. And then after a while, it blew, it blew open. But let me just do this real quick, and I'm done. When the Lord tells Jeremiah, go and say this, this is what he asked him to say. Are you listening? Yes. Chapter 2. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem. Who is Jerusalem? That's God's church, here. Yeah? That's God's church. Go and cry in the ears of my church, saying, Thus saith who? The Lord. Watch this God of ours. Watch this God of ours. He is not a God who condemns. He is a God who is merciful, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. He says, I remember the love of thine espousals. I remember the, the kindness of thy youth. You know what he's saying here? I remember you one time when you were who you were supposed to be. Yeah. When you remember that you were a chosen generation. Yeah. I remember you when you heard me say you are a royal priesthood. Yeah. I remember you when you say you are a peculiar people. Yeah. I remember those times when you accepted that. When thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. When you trusted me all through those hard times. You were with me. I remember it. Jeremiah is told to say that. Israel was holiness unto the Lord. You get that? My church was a holy church. Adhering to the principles that I have laid down that my church should subscribe to. 
and the first fruits of all the, of this increase. Anybody that messes with you, that's what that word that comes up. It says, all that devour him shall offend, even shall come upon them, saith the Lord. The Lord said, anybody mess with you, messing with me. That's what he's saying. I have your back. You don't have to worry about anything. Go and do what I have commanded you to do, and everything is going to be all right. And look in verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after what? Vanity, and have become vain. What is it that happened? I mean, wh what did I do you? What is it that you see in me that upsets you? This is God asking these questions. What have I done you, church? What have I done you, my people? I ordained you. You were not a people, and I made you a people. You were not anybody, but I made you somebody. And having done all of that, you turn your back on me, please. What have I done to cause you to behave this way. And what are they doing? They have idols. Worshipping idols. And the Lord describes them as gods that can't do nothing for you. They've forsaken the fountains of living waters. And have made themselves cisterns. Broken cisterns. That can't hold any water. Now work that one out. He said, everything that we are doing contrary to God is like if you went and mash up the fountain in the back there and bring one and put it up. Got a big hole in the bottom. It can't hold any water. That is what God is saying to us. And that is what he is chastising us about. This church, ordained by God for a special purpose, has to come back to the original standards. How much time do you spend in church? How much time do you come to Wednesday night services? What is it that you're doing on Wednesday night that is more important than coming to the church for prayer? Do you come to Sunday night service? What is it that is stopping you from coming to God's house? Do you study the word of God? I'm not asking you how many hours do you spend in the word of God? I'm going to change that. How many minutes do you spend in the house in the word of God as compared with how much time you spend doing other things. Those other things that stop you from coming into the house of God on Wednesday night for strength in prayer and reaffirmation, those things are the idols that God is now warning us about. We're not making any wood wooden stone, but we have other things that are more important in our lives than God. And I am saying to you this morning, God says, come back. Come back to me. And watch this and I'm done. We tell God, I'm at verse 22. He says, though you wash yourself with Caustic soda. That is what nitre is. You can wash yourself with caustic soda. And as much soap as you want to use. Yet thine iniquity is marked. Before me, saith the Lord. How canst thou say I am not polluted? 
because I have not gone after Balaam. How can you say you don't worship Balaam? You know who Balaam is? Those are the idols. And I will not say anymore. I want you, I give you homework. Go home and read all of Jeremiah. See how the Lord feels about us when we have left him. We heard his heart. God said, I got my hand stretched out to you all day long. And you're not paying me any attention. You, 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 you. Have you ever put your hand out to shake somebody and they don't see it? And you wish that somehow that hand would now drop off because you don't want nobody to see? That ever happened to you? Put your hand out to shake somebody and they don't see your hand out there. And you let it stay there for a little while and then you look around and try to make sure you didn't have a hand. The Lord said, I've got my hand stretched out to you all day long. You're not paying me no mind. Brethren, you're doing some good things here at this church. But you are not operating, none of us are operating on all of the cylinders. You know when a car is only operating on two or three cylinders and it's an eight-cylinder motor? It puts and sputters. It don't really put out the power that God wants us to put out. I challenge you never to say I can't again. But understand that with God you can. When you go from here to there, understand that you are empowered by God. I don't care who you are or where you are in your life. Understand that you have something to contribute. Never tell God that I can't. Because God understands that with his power, we can. God bless you.